Hi there. Can you hear me okay? All right. Thanks for being here on a Friday night. This is kind of awesome. Um, well, before I forget, it makes my publicist happy when I send her these. Every, everyone smile and say, Facebook. All right, thank you. Okay. Who is on Facebook? Who's on Twitter? Who's on Instagram? Who's not on anything? All right, okay. How are those 8-track tape collections coming along? They're, they're going to come back. It'll be 100 years from now on the Antique Roadshow. It'll be like, ooh, Captain and Tennille, one million dollars. So I'm going to hang on to those. Ah, this is so nice. I just love that you're here. Um, this is not my normal authorly event, you know. This is, normally I'm at some independent bookstore about 7 p.m. on a random Tuesday, going head to head with Dancing with the Stars. Um, <laughs> so this is perfect. I mean, I actually say that in, I say that kind of half in jest, because I, I did an event in D.C. at Politics and Prose, this wonderful indie bookstore. Um, yeah, <laughs> yes, um, it is, it's a great store. And this is a couple years ago, and I'm rolling into town, and I have a cousin who works and lives in the D.C. area. And so I texted him, and I said, uh, please come out to the bookstore, you know, support the family. Um, and he, he messages me back and is like, dude, I'd love to be there, but tonight Tom DeLay is dancing the cha-cha. So <laughs> it's my, my humbling moment from the road. Um, I wish there had been many. And I, I have to share this one with you. This is, this is one of my favorite moments from the road, and it, uh, it pertains to interviews. In, and I do a ton of interviews. Um, did two podcast interviews this afternoon. And, and, and podcasts are, are kind of a, a new and wonderful thing, but I, I do a lot of television interviews and print interviews, and I do a ton of radio interviews. And I, I do them all on my cell phone, because that's how you do them now, which is really... Um, kind of weird. I always thought I would go into the studio and, you know, be in the, the booth and all that stuff. But really, I'm just, I'm just on my cell phone. And I'm, I'm on the air live. I can be in Madison, Wisconsin on my cell phone, and I'm on the air in Miami or someplace. And I was in Portland, Oregon, and I was in my hotel, and I'm on my trusty cell phone, and I'm on the air live. And there was this incredible moment of live radio that went like this. Housekeeping! <laughs> it was, it's awesome when that happens. Um, and it's happened to me twice, so if you happen to be listening to NPR and you hear this interview where this woman brings me fresh towels, um, <laughs> not having a diva moment, um, a, a quick question, and there's no, this isn't a pass-fail, this is just for my own curiosity. But who read Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet? Oh, yay, okay. I don't do that for ego-driven purposes, um, but it's not bad <laughs> for, for that. But um, I, I tend to give people the hotel update. Even though I have a new book, and I'm going to talk about that, I have to give the hotel update. And if I don't, I mean, we're going to, I'm happy to, we'll do Q&A, and, and I'm happy to talk about that book. But if I don't sort of give that update, it's like going to see the Eagles and they don't play Hotel California. You're just like, <laughs> wait a minute. Um, but that book in particular has done something special on its own. It's very interesting. Um, and so the, the latest with that book, uh, Hotel in the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, is, and I think I think it was three and a half weeks ago we announced that it's, it's finally been optioned for film, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, there's a great producer, some very interesting directors involved, and uh, the executive producer is a man named George Takei, um, which is just great, um, because he's, he's just a very, I mean, it's, it's Uncle George. It's, it's so, so great to have someone on board who personally experienced the Japanese internment, and so he's not going to let Hollywood mess it up too much, I don't think. So I feel, I feel really good about that. The other thing that's happened with Hotel is that it's read widely in schools now. Um, it's required reading in Washington State. It's summer reading all over the place, and it's in a lot of high schools. It's in some colleges. 
And it's, this, it's, it's a dubious honor to become homework. <laughs> it's so weird um, because there are no spark notes and there's no Cliff's notes. And so, like, but, but I'm on the internet and so I'm, I'm easy to track down. And literally, and this year was no exception, um, from about August to the end of, an end of the first week of September, I'll get 20 emails per day from students who are, have been assigned my book. And they say these wonderfully sincere things like, uh, uh, Mr. Ford, I loved your book. Motel on the Corner of Sweet and Sour is my favorite. <laughs> um, if you could just answer these 12 questions. Um, <laughs> it's so ridiculous. Um, and, and this came to a particular uh, conclusion when my own children were assigned this book in high school. Um, yeah, it's not cool to, when da your dad is homework, you know? <laughs> it's not. And my daughter, Carissa, she went out on the internet and she found a bunch of tweets from students who are tweeting about my book. And because she found endless joy in sharing these tweets with me, um, I brought them to share with you. Um, these are actual tweets from actual high school students. This is from Mariah Cobb. And Mariah tweets, nobody read Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. It'll slowly tear out your heart and you'll cry your eyes out. Hashtag stupid English class. That's, that's kind of awesome. Um, you can maybe see this in the front row, but it's, it's all in caps. So this is very excited. This is from Nicholas Reed. And Nicholas tweets, who has a study guide for Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet? Sparknotes didn't have it. Hashtag emergency. So this is always good. This is from Morgan Gaccioni, and Morgan tweets, anyone want to give a good summary of Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet? I'm willing to pay in cash. <laughs> and then we get to the good ones. <laughs> this is from Alana, and Alana tweets, I would rather read Animal Farm every day of my whole life than effing read Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet. <sighs> Just feel that, right? Oh. Things that keep you humble. Um, and this is my all-time favorite tweet. This is from Emma. And Emma tweets, more like hotel on the corner of this book sucks Boulevard. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> what, what they don't realize, I'm fueled creatively by the angst of teenagers. So when they get like a pimple on prom night, I get stronger. So it's, it's, it's okay. Um, and. And truthfully, I, I'm sharing the salacious ones with you, but I do get just as many that are of a different order. And I especially like it when I get the tweets from young male readers, because typically they're very resistant readers at that age. I was a resistant reader. And so when I see a tweet, and I can see in the little photo that it's a boy with his shoulder pads and his jersey, and he's just made varsity and football, and he'll say something like, this is the first time I was forced to read a book that I actually loved. And that's, a, that's something, you know? I, like, it's nice to be a bestseller and win an occasional award, but if I can be, and, and I, I, I think everyone in this room will understand this when I say this, if I can be the gateway drug book for that boy, then, in a tiny incremental way, I've made the world a better place. And I know what that book was for me, and I think all of us will reach, you know, at some point in our literary reading journey, we hit a book, sometimes it's a very young age, sometimes it's not till we're in our 40s, but you read that book and you're like, oh, this is why people read, I get it, this book is just for me. And so those are, those are really special moments, and I, I do cherish those. But even when, I, when, when she would share the, uh, you know, kind of the, the funny ones with me, I would favorite their tweets, and then they'd be like, the author favorited my tweet! <laughs> Retweeted! Yeah, it was super exciting, so. Um, but I'm here to talk about a new book, and it's, it's very interesting in that I was in Winston-Salem a couple weeks ago, and I was talking to a woman, and I just mentioned, I just said, I really love this book, 
And she asked a very interesting question. She said, well, don't you love all your books? And I thought about it, and books are like my children. You know, I, I love them all equally, but some caused me more pain and suffering. <laughs> and, and, and this one, it was just kind of, I was just really happy with the whole process. And so the new book, Love and Other Consolation Prizes, it's, it's a book bookended between two World's Fairs in Seattle. There's the 62 World's Fair, which is the Space Needle, and um, that's the World's Fair that Elvis went to, and they filmed the movie. Um, has anyone ever seen that movie? <laughs> in, in the pantheon of Elvis films, which are not great, it is exceptionally awful. Um, <laughs> so, but I watched it, and it's set at that fair, but much of the book is set in the time period of the first World's Fair in Seattle, which was in 1909. And it's really Seattle's forgotten World's Fair. And at that World's Fair, they had interesting things going on in that they had um, ethnographic exhibits, which is basically they would take an indigenous people and put them on display and charge money to see them, like a human zoo. And they had um, a newborn baby exhibit where newborn babies were in incubators and you could pay to go see this new technology. And there were nurses in uniform, but they weren't really nurses. They were carnies wearing nurses uniform. It was just, you know, it's just a little odd. It's, this is how the world worked in 1909. And at that fair, they had themed days. And every day they had a theme and a prize. And so on Agriculture Day, they raffled off a milking cow. And on Mining Day, they raffled off 3,000 copper ingots. And on September 15th, 1909, the day President Taft was there, it was Washington Children's Day, they raffled off a boy. And his name was Ernest. And he was donated by the Washington Children's Receiving Home. And there were ads advertising this giveaway. And there were quotes from a man named L.J. Covington, the director of the receiving home, talking about this giveaway. And no one knows whatever became of this boy. And I was always curious, and because I, I couldn't find whatever happened to him, I really made up his story. I wanted to tell his story. And in my story, he's a half Chinese boy who comes from China under somewhat unscrupulous circumstances, and he ends up as the prize, and he ends up raffled off, and he ends up won by a woman named Florence Nettleton, who was a real woman in Seattle. She was known as Madame Flora, because Seattle had this vibrant red light district. And Seattle also had this vibrant suffrage movement at the same time, and so Ernest is working in a very high-class, fancy sporting house, which is a fancy way of saying a parlor joint, which is a fancy way of saying it's a, a, a den of inequity. <laughs> And there he falls in love with two girls. And it's a very simple coming of age love story. Very innocent, but in this world where everyone and everything is for sale. He falls in love with, with, a, with one of the, a maid named Fawn and the daughter of the madam named Maisie. And it's set in this uh, turbulent area of Seattle. And this is one of those, those, those funny moments where as I'm rolling into town, my, my publicist emails me, and she's like, you know, you really should talk about your personal experiences as they relate to the book. Um, I don't know how much time you guys have spent in brothels, but if, I don't know what the mean average for brothel time in America is, but whatever that average is, I'm well below it. Um, and so, I, I really can't help you out there, but, I have been in love, and when I was the same age as my main character, which is about 12, 13, I had a crush. Not on one girl, I had a crush on a set of twins. Um, and when you have a crush on a set of twins, you think that's gonna work in your favor. You know, the, the, you have the numerical advantage, and, and their names were Heather and Holly Farrow. 
And Heather and Holly, who I was crushing on both of them, the two of them simultaneously in stereo had crushes on my best friend, Sean Wilson. And, and, it, and it's, it's really sad at that age because suddenly my life had become you know, a story problem and it was long division and I was always the lonely remainder, okay? And it came to a flashpoint for me at this very important event where I lived for sixth graders, um, known as the school skating party. Um, we didn't have dances, but once a month we had the school skating party. And we would go, and the most important part of the entire evening was the last song of the night, because it was the much anticipated couple skate. And you never wanted to be that kid who, you know, is unlacing your skates and putting on your street shoes while all the other kids are holding hands and skating to sixth grade nirvana to the romantic strains of the little river band or whatever was, you know, the 70s music at the time. And so I went and I'm, I'm keeping an eye on Heather, I'm keeping an eye on Holly, and as the DJ announced the couple skate and cues up the last record, you know, my palms are sweaty and I'm trying to make my hair not look like awkward fifth grade boy hair. And I'm looking around, I can't find Heather or Holly. And I look out on the skating rink and Sean Wilson is skating with both of them. <laughs> it was heartbreaking. Um, and, you know, I kind of started my authorly journey around that time because I had the longest uh, school bus ride. I was the first kid picked up, last kid dropped off, which means I was on the bus for like an hour each way. And because of that, I had plenty of time to daydream. And so I would just remember going down the bumpy country road and just staring out the window and just replaying that evening. But I was gonna rewrite that story and be like, in, in my story, you know, there would be this is the 70s, so disaster movies were very popular. Like, there'd be a terrible earthquake, and Sean would get pinned under a foosball machine, and I would rescue Heather or rescue Holly, or I would just make up stories. I became a really good daydreamer. And in many ways, I get paid to be a daydreamer. There's times where I've done my taxes, and I go to the accountant, and it says writer or author, and I just want to cross it out and just write daydreamer. Because that's kind of what I do, is I just daydream stories and I write them down. And if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna share a little bit of one of those daydreams with you. And when it comes to author readings, um, I'm just gonna read like a page and a half and, and we'll talk some more. Um, I, I really don't read a lot um, at author readings. I, I, I'd much rather answer questions and things like that. but. But I, I keep my readings super short for a couple of reasons. Um, one is I have this weird theory slash paranoia that because we were all read to as children at bedtime. I, my fear is I'm gonna go long one of these days. I'm gonna look up, just be like <laughs> and I, I don't want that. But the other reason is I did a book event at, I think it was Coral Gables, Florida. And I was about to read, and this lovely cotton-haired woman in the very back kind of half stood up in her chair and blurted out, we already know how to read. <laughs> and that's awesome when that happens. Um, and uh, she, I was actually kind of delighted in that moment because it made me realize that all of us, at some point, we're gonna arrive at an age where we can say anything we want <laughs> under any social circumstance. We have earned that right. And so I look forward to that day. So that's, you know, we all can look forward to that. That's a good thing. Um, this, the, you know, the book is Love and Other Constellation Stories. It's a book about history and a little bit about race, a little bit about social classes, a lot about the roles of women and how they have changed or haven't changed over the course of history. Um, but it is, it is also a love story. And 
I'm going to share a little bit of that with you. This is a, a ways into the book. We've met the character of Ernest, and we've met Fawn and Maisie. And it's very clear there's this simple affection going on between them. But what's happened is Madame Flora has decided to take all of the working girls and all of the servants, and they're going to go to what was known as Hurrah Day, the final day of the World's Fair, grand closing ceremonies. And so Ernest goes, and he spends the first half of the day with Vaughn, the second half with Maisie. And he's saved up his, his money, his earnings, because he knows there's a captive hot air balloon. So he pays for the last ride of the night. And he and Maisie board this balloon, and they're lofted 1,500 feet above the World's Fair. And they're looking down below, and it's what is now the, the campus of the University of Washington. And there's these grand fountains and reflecting pools and all these ornate buildings that are direct, that are, they're all decorated with, with lights, electric lights. And so it's this gorgeous scene, and then the lights go out. Ernest closed his eyes, and when he opened them again, the world had fallen into darkness. The lights had been put out to mark the official closing of the fair. The lit buildings, the street lamps, every bulb had vanished into pitch black, as if the world below them had fallen away, swallowed whole. He heard the crowd for a moment, then an aching silence, followed by a lone bugler who played a sad melody. Ernest sniffled and held his emotions in check as he thought about happier moments, Fawn's oatmeal cookies, her warm, soft kisses, lying next to Maisie on that soft bed of clover, trading bites of crisp, sugar-coated apples. He tried to take those new memories and the broken pieces of his heart, rearrange them, somehow mend them together, even as his eyes adjusted to the darkness and he strained to find definition in the murky world he was floating in. That's when he felt Maisie slide closer, wrapping the blanket around his shoulders. He could feel her warmth through plush, supple layers of fabric. She smelled like perfume and flowers and happiness. Ernest's heart raced as the gondola drifted, as they heard wistful strains wafting up from the crowd below. 50,000, 100,000 people began singing Auld Lang Syne. And surrounded by emptiness, gently rocking to the sound of melancholy, Ernest and Maisie sang along in whispers. He turned as she leaned closer and her arms slipped into a quiet embrace. He felt her hair on his cheek, the softness of her breath as his hands found her waist. He was awed at her touch and what the human heart is capable of feeling, such sadness, such shame, but such acceptance, such joy, all at the same time. The balloon swayed and he said, steady, I've got you, I've got you too, she whispered. Then he looked down, noticing flickering lights, the city on the horizon. He marveled at the beautiful, challenging world beneath them, so far away, and he thought, I wonder if the best thing any of us can hope for in life is a soft place to land. He felt Maisie nod as though she knew his thoughts, and he held on tighter. And then the night exploded. Their ears filled with the booming echoes of cannon reports as fireworks burst all around them. Blooming peonies and chrysanthemums filled the darkness. Star-like shells rose to greet them, flashing like comets, painting the sky with swashes of sparkling, flickering, glowing embers that slowly rained back down in a beautifully arranged marriage of fire and gravity. Ernest closed his eyes for a moment and he could still see the shimmering display. He could hear the rhythmic, booming cadence of explosions in every direction. Then he opened his eyes again and it was like they were standing in the heart of a snow globe, a blizzard of white hot stars as far as the eye could see. He felt Maisie's hand on his chest. See, she said, smiling in the flashing, waning colors. This life, your life, my life, the happy memories, the sad stories, the hellos, the goodbyes, you, me, Fawn, everything is connected always. Ernest felt her words more than he heard them, and then he sensed the balloon begin to descend slowly beneath the canopy of pyrotechnics, sinking them into the darkness. Thanks for letting me read that to you. Um, oh, thank you. I mentioned a skating party, and I mentioned a set of twins, Heather and Holly Farrow. Before the book came out, I was asked to write a guest essay on love stories. And I, I wrote a bit about that evening. 
and I mentioned the twins um, by name. And it was published. And then it went out on the internet. <laughs> and then they read it. <laughs> and then they contacted me. Do you want to hear what they said? Um, I was walking through the Denver airport, and my phone lit up, and it was a blast from the past. Uh, I saved the message here. Um, this was on Facebook, and it was both of them. Uh, <laughs> this is from Heather, and Heather uh, is, is, says, I read this today, made me tearful and smile. This is the sweetest article, and I am honored. And she goes on to say, I especially like being the cute, smart twin, and I think I was way cooler than my stupid sister, Holly. <laughs> um, <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Um, that I'm like, ha ha, you were both cute and smart. I was the far dorkier sidekick to Sean Wilson. Um, and Holly chimes in and says, do you hear that, Heather? Both. And I think Jamie just winked at me too. Jamie, your article made my heart hurt, and if it means anything, I would have pushed Heather down to skate with you. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you put on the internet. Um, and it, it turns out, uh, I guess Holly lives in Baltimore, Heather lives in Oregon, I live in Montana, but we agreed that if we're ever in the same city, we're gonna go skating and I'm gonna cross this off my fifth grade bucket list forever. So. Thank you so much for having me.